Well, loved ones, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, huh? Praise the Lord. We, we made it, and we made it through the snowdrifts tonight, huh? Come on. That's an act of God in and of itself. Go, Lord. And I love seeing you all here. For those of you who are visiting with us for the first time, maybe with some of your family or some of your friends or neighbors or coworkers, I want to wish you a special welcome. My name is Ray, and I have the privilege of serving here as the senior pastor of this church. And I mean this in every sense of the word. It is truly a joy. Truly a joy to be worshiping with you tonight. Let's get into God's word. Uh, open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 18. We're going to verse 25. If you do not have a copy of God's word, let me tell you, you're going to need a Bible in front of you tonight. And so our ushers are coming forward right now. Just put your hand up nice and high. We want to give you a copy of God's word so you can follow along. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Yeah, don't be shy. Get those hands up nice and high. That's such a good rhyme, eh? Don't be shy. Get them up high. Love it. Love it. Love it. All right? And so Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. All right, well, look around us, loved ones. <clears throat> I don't know if you noticed driving in here, maybe you noticed this, and if you're doing some Christmas shopping, maybe you're in your neighborhoods, um, Christmas time, would you agree, is light time. It's light time. Look at all these beautiful lights going on. Maybe you have them on your house. I have them on mine. Praise the Lord for that. Christmas time is light time. You see it all over. I love one of my favorite things to do at Christmas is get down in the mornings really early before the rest of the family gets up, open up God's word with a nice piping hot cup of coffee and sit in front, plug in the Christmas tree and get these little glowing lights all over the place. Just so beautiful. It's one of my favorite things to do. Christmas time is light time. But we also see here, uh, Christmas time is gift time, isn't it? Okay, truth be told, how many of you are done your Christmas shopping? Come on, oh, only a few hands. All right, well, you still got a little time. You're good. You can crash the Walmart if it's still open. That's good, right? Christmas time is gift time. We give gifts. We receive gifts, right? And, and I don't know about you. We were in a store yesterday, uh, my wife and I, and they said the, the lineup from the cashier was all the way to the back of the store, which was like basically, if I looked at it, like half a kilometer. The place was huge. And it was backed all the way up. Like, it's gift time. Christmas time, though, as you look around, uh, it is hope time. It's hope time, isn't it? You go around and, and there's, a serious, there's a sense of hope. It's like, okay, 2022 is coming to an end. Maybe it didn't go so well for you. Maybe it did go well, but there's a sense of hope because 2023 is just around the corner. Right, And so you get that sense of hope when you hear the Christmas carols and sing the songs and you see the lights and the gifts and the... The reality also is Christmas time can be a hard time, can it? Let's recognize that. Maybe some, some of us are here tonight, and this Christmas is hard for you. You know, in a new way, it's hard for my family and I, as it's the first Christmas without my wife's father. You know, it's, it's hard. And in amongst the joy, in amongst the, the hope that's there, and the gifts and the lights, there's, there's a bit of a grief too, isn't there? Maybe for some of us, we've lost loved ones to sickness. Um, maybe relationships are strained, and we're just reminded of that in this Christmas. We're feeling that sense of isolation. But no matter where you're at, I want to encourage you with this. Um, Christmas time is light time, gift time, hope time. It can be a hard time, but here's the big thing about Christmas. Christmas time is declaration time. Christmas time is declaration time. What's it declaring? You'll see it on the screen. Write it down. Jesus is the Messiah who has come to us. And you must believe in him alone for salvation. There's, the dec there's Christmas right there. There is the declaration of Christmas. That is the truth. Honestly, loved ones, hear the word of the Lord. That is the truth that every one of those lights represents. That's the truth that every one of those gifts that you give and are given represents. That is the truth that every sense of hope that you get in this season comes from, right there. That Jesus, the Messiah, has come to us and you must believe in him alone for salvation. That right there, that truth is what gives us hope in the grief. 
That truth right there is what gives us comfort in the hardship and in the isolation. The light of the world, Jesus Christ has come. The gift of gifts, the hope for the hopeless, the prince of peace, the healer of the broken. Here's what it means. God with us. God with us. But there's a problem that you and I face. Every person here tonight, including myself, we face this every single day, and that is our unbelief that that's true. Right there on that screen. That Jesus is the Messiah who has come to us, and we must believe in him alone for salvation. The problem you and I face in realizing and living in light of that truth is our unbelief. We hear that truth. Maybe you're here and this isn't your first Christmas service. Maybe you've been to lots and you're just like, okay, you know, just get me through this. Get me to my eggnog. Please hurry up, right? Maybe that's some of you right here tonight. Others, you've been coming because you've been raised in a, in a family that's come on Christmas Eve and you've heard the Christmas story and it's like, yeah, okay, Jesus the Messiah. I'll get around to Jesus later. You've heard that truth many times. You haven't responded to it. Maybe you're here And you want that to be true. You're like, I want to believe that Jesus came to give the abundant life with freedom from sin. I want to believe that's true, but I just can't get there. I want healing. I want reconciliation with God. I want to know that when I pass from this world into the next one, I will be with God. Can you say that for sure tonight? Maybe some of you are like, I just don't care that that's true. I don't even believe there's a God. So thankful that you're here. We refuse to believe it. And what's the result of our unbelief in this? We're living in darkness. It's like we can unplug all those lights right now. If we were to unplug every light in this room right now, it would be completely dark. And the spiritual reality for our life, if we refuse to believe in Jesus alone for our salvation, is that is the picture of our life right now. In the dark. Lights out. Not living in the freedom Christ gives. Living with hopelessness instead of the true hope. Living anxious and fearful instead of with true peace. He's the prince of peace. Can't have it without him. Living joyless instead of joyful. You ever notice? Christmas time is is joy time, isn't it? It's supposed to be joy time. You ever notice how unjoyful we can get at Christmas? I'm going to the next family dinner. Oh, long lines. Oh, cold weather. Christmas time is joy time. We're not going to find that from this world. Jesus is the source of true joy. Instead, we live in the hurt and pain and brokenness instead of true healing in him. But I want to encourage us, every one of us here tonight, no matter where you are at, doesn't have to be this way. Amen? Doesn't have to be this way. Jesus, the Messiah, has come and offers you salvation, but you must believe in him for it. And here in our text today, this beautiful text from very normal human beings involved in this Christmas story, we see two life-changing truths that we must believe, loved ones. If we are to receive the gift of all gifts, right here, maybe some of you are gonna get some great gifts this Christmas, but it pales in comparison to the gift of all gifts right here. You know what that is? Salvation in Jesus Christ. Right there. Salvation in Christ and living in freedom and the life that he offers. Two truths we must believe. You ready to go? Let's stand to honor the authority of God's word and we will read it together. Matthew chapter one, verses 18 to 25. Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Let's go, nice and loud. Kids, nice and loud, okay? Matthew 1, 18, 25, let's go. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she'd given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Hear the word of the Lord and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Let's get into Christmas. See, Jesus has come to give salvation, but you must believe, number one, here it is, first truth we got to believe, his supernatural birth, that there's no one like him. His supernatural birth, there's no one like him. See, here's, here's what we mean by that. Jesus was born fully God and fully man. Just think about that for a second. Jesus Christ was born as fully God and fully man. Here's the question facing you and I tonight. Will you believe it? Fully God fully man. Let's get our context. It's the first Christmas season. First Christmas right here. And we're in the small town of Nazareth. You'll see a map. Here it is. Here it is. There's Israel. You see Nazareth in the northern part of Israel. Here, show the next shot. That's Nazareth today. And you see that big glowing church in the middle of the town, right? I've been there. And they have built that Catholic church right there because that's the place they believe Joseph and Mary had their home. Okay, underneath it. You can walk in there and see this little, humble little house where they supposedly lived. And here in our text today, a young man named Joseph is betrothed to a woman named Mary who was a virgin. Now you gotta understand, Mary's about 12 to 14 years old. She's 12 to 14. She's like a teenager, early teenager. And Joseph's not much older than that. She's 12 to 14, and they both come from poor families, dirt poor. If you walk into that house where that church is built upon, you see it's tiny. There's like two rooms, max. There's nothing special about Joseph and Mary in the world's eyes, nothing. They're not like your A-listers in society with all the glitz and the glamour. They're poor. They're young little teenagers, And yet notice verse 18, it says they're betrothed. We have a word for that in our society today, and that is engaged. They are engaged. And what does that mean? Well, it's a little different here in the first century than in the 21st century today. When you were betrothed, it means you were legally pledged to be married. You were legally pledged. If you guys were betrothed, Husband and a wife, it was, you couldn't just say, nah, I changed my mind and walked out of it. You actually needed a legal certificate of divorce to get out of it. And the betrothal period was 12 months. You were betrothed for a year. And during that time, you actually wouldn't see each other. So here's Joseph during this betrothal period, he's getting the house ready and preparing for his wife. There's Mary during this period getting prepared to be a wife. And they're not seeing each other. And that's why, you know, because they're, they're legally pledged to be married, that's why in verses 19 and 20, if you look at the text, go back to the text, you see that? It says they were husband and wife. Because it was like, it's a done deal. And we just need to formalize it with the ceremony. But they're already legally pledged and they stayed apart because they wanted to avoid couples that were betrothed in Jewish culture and tradition they stayed apart because they wanted to avoid any hint of sexual immorality because there's some serious consequences for that as we will see in just a few moments so they were staying apart but notice also as we see throughout scripture in the gospel of Luke Mary and Joseph both feared the Lord That means they wanted to honor the Lord. They were faithful to him to follow his commands. And so here's the key we have to understand. This couple, this teenage couple, is the couple that God chose to be the earthly parents of his son, Jesus. This little couple. 
but he did it in a way that no one expected. No one could have expected this. It was a supernatural birth that was humanly impossible. Humanly impossible. You say, what do you mean by that? Here's the first thing. Write it down. We, it declared there's no one like Jesus. Why? Because it was a virgin birth. It was a virgin birth. Go back to the text, verses 18 and 19. Eyes in the book, so good. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. That is an authoritative statement. You notice that? It took place like this. It wasn't, well, it maybe took place like this. It could have taken place like this. Notice the authority of God's word. This is how his son was born authoritative statement. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man, that is, righteous man who feared the Lord, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Oh, we've got a major issue here. Did you check it out in that text? There's a major issue that's going on. Uh, what's the issue? Um, well, just that everything in Joseph's life is getting thrown out of whack right now. It is turned upside down. Can you imagine Joseph? He's like, he's preparing the home. Put yourself in his shoes. Preparing the home, the betrothal's on. I'm getting ready for this woman that I love and she's getting ready for me and, and I'm getting all things. I want to be a faithful husband who honors the Lord and then you find out she's pregnant. And it's not from you. There's a major issue happening here. See, don't skip over this. Yes, Joseph feared the Lord and he loved him. He was human. How would you feel? He's got a major problem, he thinks. Mary is pregnant. And notice how Matthew, the writer of this gospel, one of the apostles and disciples of Jesus, notice what he said to just drill the point down a little bit more. Verse, eight, or verse 18, he says they hadn't come together. He's just driving the point. They have, there's been no activity happening here. They've been living apart as they should be, wanting to honor the Lord and each other. This wasn't allowed for Mary to be pregnant. The only explanation, if I'm Joseph, if you're Joseph, the only explanation at this point was that if Mary was pregnant, it was because she cheated on him and committed adultery. That's it. That's all he's got right now. Here's what it means. It meant, so what's the, what's the con? Remember I told you there were consequences for this? What are the consequences? Well, there's a few. Number one, they'd be shamed by the community. Mary, Joseph, and their families. They have just now become the gossip talk of the entire town of Nazareth. And you see that it was going on because in John 8, 41, the religious leaders come to Jesus and said, we weren't born in sexual immorality, hinting like you were, buddy. So they're on the gossip train right now. And it's going down. Their family's reputation's finished. But here, here's something even more serious. The penalty for adultery was stoning to death. So Mary was going to be stoned when people found this out. This is why, did you notice the text in verse 19? Go back to the text. This is why in verse 19, it says, Joseph was unwilling to put her to shame because he knew what's about to come down the pipe. He's unwilling to put her to shame. So what was he going to do? Look at the text. What was he going to do? Divorce her quietly. He was a just man. That means righteous in the eyes of God, which means if you want to honor the Lord, it means your life is a life of compassion. Your life is a life of mercy towards others. And so even though he's feeling so betrayed right now, look at the man of faith this teenager is. This is challenging for me. He's like, I'm not going to shame her. I want to honor the Lord. Maybe for some of us in this room, you're getting together with family. And maybe you don't have the strongest relationship with them. 
maybe it's just divided. And you, there's part of you that wants to go in with your guns blazing when you see that person who's hurt you. I want you to remember Joseph right here. The just man in the eyes of God, he says, I'm not going to shame her. I'm going to honor the Lord with my lips, in my mind, and in my heart. See, here's the key we need to see from these first three verses, 18 to 20. Did you notice this? Mary was a virgin. Did you, did you notice that right here? It says, to be with child, verse 18, from the Holy Spirit. Mary was a virgin. She hadn't cheated on Joseph. She was faithful to the Lord. She was faithful to him. She hadn't cheated on him. We see in the Gospel of Luke, it says she feared the Lord, and she was favored by God. And so what that means is this, loved ones, whether you've heard this part of the Christmas story a hundred times or this is your first time, here's what this means. Think of this. Virgin mother. You know what that means? That is naturally impossible. Virgin mother. It's naturally impossible. So if it's naturally impossible, then what it means is Jesus' birth was not natural. It was supernatural. It was supernatural. How do you say how? Through a virgin. Here's the second thing. Write it down. By the Spirit of God. By the Spirit. Go on to verses 20 and 21. But as he can... So here's Joseph. He's in this awkward position. He He doesn't know that it's by the Spirit at this point. Watch this. But as he considered these things, that means how am I going to work this divorce in a way that's not going to shame Mary and cover up and keep her reputation? As he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Of course. Of course. Angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will, look at the promise, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. See, notice God's sovereign timing. Because God is sovereign. That means he executes his power over all his creation, which is all of us and this world and the heavens as we know it and all the stuff we don't know. God looks into Joseph's heart. He sees what he's thinking and he goes, I gotta get to him. I'm gonna pay him a visit. And in his sovereign timing, as Joseph is considering, who knows, maybe Joseph was like an hour away from enacting that divorce. Maybe he was a week away. We don't know. But what we do know is that God in his omniscience, that means he knows everything. He looks at Joseph, sees him, sees him struggling, sees the wheels turning. And what does he do? Let's send him a visitor. He sends an angel. Who's this angel? Gabriel, verse 20. He sends, it to, sends Gabriel to him in a dream to reassure Joseph that Mary hasn't been unfaithful. The baby did not come from a man. The baby came from God Almighty himself. Through what? The Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, who's we saw in our opening video there. I love that video. He is the third person of the Trinity. Remember, one God, three distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, each fully God. And yet... The Holy Spirit, God Almighty himself, conceives the Son of God in the virgin's womb. It's conceived by the Holy Spirit. It is a divine conception. So you know what this means? Just let this, let just, just let this blow your mind again for a moment here. Um, Jesus had no human biological father. Just say it again. Jesus 
had no human biological father. Think about that. Do you ever think about that when you hear the Christmas story? No one else, here's what this means, let's break it down. No one else who's ever existed, including you and me, listen, listen, can ever say this. Everyone in this room right now and the 8 billion people around this world exist from a biological father. There's only one son who never did, Jesus Christ. Conceived by the Holy Spirit in the virgin's womb. See, Joseph had nothing to do with this up to this point. He had nothing to do with it. And so this truth right here that Matthew's emphasizing, that Christmas details for us is so important because it means this, that Jesus was fully God. He was conceived by God Almighty himself. He existed from eternity past. He was with God in the beginning, John 1.1. 1, 1. But when he took on flesh, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So he was fully God. He was the son of God. Listen, no one created God. And because Jesus is fully God, no one created Jesus. He is uncreated he existed from eternity. Say, so you got something to back that up? Yeah, you bet I do. Great question. You'll see it on the screen. In the beginning was the word. Now, what you say, well, what word? Do you notice how that's a capital W? Do you know why that's a capital? Because it's a name. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. The word being Jesus Christ. He's with God, but the word was God. See that? God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus wasn't created. He's been, he's eternal. He's been there with God all along. So it means as he's fully God, get this loved ones, think about this. Jesus has the full range of divine characteristics. The full range. Luke 1.35, this is why Gabriel visits Mary. So we're looking at when he visited Joseph. But in Luke, he visited Mary, and he says, and the child shall be holy. No other birth in this room or on this planet or in heavens can say that. The child shall be holy, which means he had the full range of divine characteristics. He, was, he had the righteousness of God. He had full power of God. He was sinless. By the way, that's super key. If the child's holy, it means he's without sin. Jesus was sinless. He was literally God from God. Can we just all agree? Just everyone take your hands for a sec. Love to see you taking notes. Take your hands, put it like this, and just go like this. Jesus was literally God from God. Awesome. There he is, conceived by the Holy Spirit. But that wasn't all. Notice, who did he come through? A human woman. What does that make him? He was fully God. He's conceived by God Almighty himself, the Holy Spirit, but he's coming through the Virgin Mary. What it means is this, he's also fully man. It means he's not only the son of God, he was the son of man. This is called, in John 1.14, the incarnation. To incarnate means to take on flesh. So here's God Almighty himself coming to earth, conceived by the Spirit, and in the virgin's womb, he's taking on flesh. He's getting toenails and nerve endings and spinal cords and hair and rods and cones in his eyes. He's humbling himself to this. That's why John 1.14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And what this means and should give us so much hope with today is this. Jesus, not only he's not some unknowing, can't relate to us God. It means this. He took on not only the full divine characteristics, but full human characteristics as well. He grew up like we do. 
And I say to my boys often, I'm a father of four boys by the grace of God, and I say to my boys often, I, I just probably wouldn't have wanted to be one of Jesus' brothers growing up because he was always right. I'm like, come on! There is Jesus again. He grew up. He was teased by his brothers. His own brothers didn't even believe in him. Right? And so he had the full range. He had to learn like we do. Luke 2, 52. He grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God. He had to learn how to eat like you and I do. Just like this. God from God. The one who's giving Mary breath to feed him is needing to learn how to eat from her. What? What? See, the more you think about it, the more staggering it becomes. That Jesus was exalted in perfect glory and he humbled himself to come to earth to learn how to eat so he could save you and I from our sin. His love drove him to that. His love for you. You know, it's, it's just amazing that God loves you and I so much he couldn't stand to be apart from us. So I'll learn how to eat like a baby. I'll have my diaper changed by my teenage mom. He was tempted in the same way you and I are. That should give us a lot of hope today. He can identify with us. And here, here's the beautiful thing. Because he was holy, because he was fully God too and fully man, he never sinned once. He was sinless. Not one sin in 33 years of his life on earth. 33 years. And what this means is Jesus had two distinct natures. The nature of God and the nature of man. Yet working in perfect unity with each other. It's mind-blowing. There's no one like him. There's no one like him and never will be. Jesus was born as fully God and fully man, but here's the truth. This is probably one of the greatest stumbling blocks to people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. They hear that, they read it in the truth of God's word, and they say, I can't believe it. Will you believe it? And you may say, how can that be? That's impossible. And I want to remind you, hey, if you're feeling like that, you just flip over to Luke 1.34 and you'll see that Mary said the exact same thing when Gabriel told her how this was going to happen. And the Holy Spirit would come upon her. And she goes, how can this be? I'm a virgin. How can this be? Mary's saying the same thing you and I were when we heard this the first time, huh? How can this be? And the same angel, Gabriel, who spoke to Joseph right here, she, he speaks to Mary in the Gospel of Luke and says this right there on the screen, for nothing will be impossible with God. The one who created all things and is sovereign and who created you and I and every one of your toenails and nerve endings and synapses and, and your brain matter and all of this stuff is the same one who is sovereign over all creation. He can do whatever he wants because he is God. And he will work all things in your life and mine out for our greatest good and his greatest glory if we turn to Jesus Christ and are saved. See, will you believe it? And maybe you're here and you're like, there's something inside of you right now. It's like, I actually, I want to believe that. I just, I, intellectually, I just can't get there. I can't get there. Here, here's where it starts. Pray this. Start right now. Even pray it right in your seat right now. Lord, if this is true, I just, Lord, if this is true, I want to believe it. But help my unbelief and open my eyes and heart to know the truth that will set me free. Open my eyes and my heart to receive the gift of gifts right now, if this is really true. And the same Holy Spirit who opened the eyes of Joseph and Mary and billions of other people across history you pray that, he will open yours if you want to believe. But that's your choice. See, Jesus has come for our salvation and there's no one like him.
fully God and fully man, but you must believe in his supernatural birth. And from this final point today, you must believe his salvation promise. His his supernatural birth and his salvation promise that there's salvation in no one but him. Salvation in no one but him. See, salvation is given through Jesus alone. Here's the truth facing. The question of Christmas is this. Will you believe in him? That's the question of Christmas. Watch this. Go back to the text, Matthew 1, 21 to 23. It's so good. Get ready. 21 to 23. She, that is Mary, Gabriel goes on to say, remember this is the dream, to Joseph. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will, look at the promise, save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Awesome. You see that? After declaring to Joseph the nature of Jesus as fully God, fully man, confirming the divine conception, Gabriel now declares the mission and the promise of Jesus. And notice this. It says there in verse 22, the Lord had spoken by the prophet. What prophet is he talking about? The prophet Isaiah, who gave this prophecy to King Ahaz. The Syrian King Ahaz. You can look him up in history. Ahaz existed. Look up the prophet Isaiah. You can see that he existed. Look, he gave this, this prophecy six to 700 years before this moment right here. Six to 700 years earlier, verse 22. And here's what we got to understand, loved ones. You say, well, that's impossible. Listen, you don't have to throw away your intellect to believe the virgin birth and the truth about Jesus Christ. You don't have to. This was given, and this is one prophecy. We listed a whole bunch more in the worship set earlier. And there's hundreds more all throughout Scripture pointing towards this moment right here, that Jesus is the only Messiah. And it says, notice this, he will save his people from their sins. That's what, what's in a name. Here's what's in Jesus' name. It means Savior. Jehovah saves. Now, who are his people? Notice that. He will save. Notice it doesn't just say, he'll save people. He'll save all people from their sins. It doesn't say that, does it? What does it say? He will save his people from their sins. Who are his people? Those who've repented of their sin and confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And only those people will be saved. His people. Those are the children of God. And notice the result. He will give them salvation. Look at verse 21 again. I'm going to read it. Okay, put all your Christmas plans aside again for a moment. This is Christmas right here, verse 21, summed up in one verse. I'm going to read it again. I'm going to read it slowly. This is Christmas. 21, eyes in the book. Let's go. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, right here, for he will save his people from their sins. There's Christmas. That's what every one of these lights flickers to represent. That's what every one of those gifts you'll unwrap tomorrow represents. He will save his people from their sins. The word save there, by the way, means to deliver out of danger in the Greek. It means to deliver out of danger. See, and you say, well, wait a sec, I wanted like a nostalgic Christmas service. Hear about some wise men bringing some gifts and things like that. Listen, listen, you, look at the screen. You can't understand the greatest gift of Christmas, next slide, until you understand the greatest, gravest truth that it addresses. You and I can't understand the greatest gift of Christmas until we understand the gravest truth that it addresses. And that is the grave truth about our sin. And the danger, notice save means to deliver from danger. The danger that our sin puts us in. Because here's the truth we need to face that Christmas confronts. Every single one of us has a problem. You and me. 
Every single one of the 8 billion people on this planet has a problem. But loved ones, it's, it's a problem that not a single one of us can fix on our own. We can't fix it. And what's that? The problem is sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You commit one sin and you've disqualified yourself from getting to heaven on your own. One. And what is sin? Let's just be clear. You'll see it on the screen. Any failure to conform to God's moral law in act, attitude, or nature. Our thoughts, our actions, and even our nature. Because we are born from two human parents, right? And we've inherited our very first father, Adam's guilt from his sin. Act, attitude, or nature. The moral law of God. What's that? The word of God. And you, you see the impact of this. You can't tell me you look on the news and you can't see the impact of sin on our world. You can't tell me that. You say, we're all just good people. We'll go to turn on the news. You can't tell me that. And I won't try to tell you that. You see the devastating impact and the danger of sin on marriages, on children, on nations. You felt it in your own life, and so have I. The brokenness, the grief, that something's wrong. Something's not right. Something's not the way it was meant to be. You feel it, and so do I. And this is the danger of sin. It separates us from God. In fact, without the Savior confessing our sin and repenting of it, confessing Jesus as Lord, the Bible's very clear. We are enemies of God. We're enemies of God. And so you see what Christmas is right here? The greatest divine rescue mission in history. The greatest rescue mission in all of history. Jesus, God invading his creation to save us. See, and here's the thing about this. We cannot defeat sin on our own. We can never be good enough for our salvation. You, today, I hear this so much. Well, I'll just be a good person and then I'll get to heaven. I'll be a good person, then I'll get to heaven. Listen, loved one, in, in love, I say this. It has nothing to do with you being a good person, but everything to do with you being a saved person. That's Christmas, verse 21. It has nothing to do with you being a good person. It has everything to do with, are you a saved person? Saved by the blood of Jesus Christ alone. This is why Acts 4.12 says, there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of so-called names out there today of God's we can be saved by. Just hear the word of the Lord. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved in the name of Jesus Christ and left to ourselves to try to earn our way to heaven and clean ourselves up. It will, here's where it leads, ready? Not to the presence of God. It leads us to eternity apart from the presence of God in hell. This is the danger that Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is emphasizing right here. Saving them, delivering them from danger 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift, free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's it. That's what Jesus came to save us from. And yet by believing that Jesus is the only Messiah and that he came to earth fully God and fully man and lived a perfect and sinless life and went to the cross and took the full wrath of God, God's hatred against sin, he took our place on that cross out of his great love for us to pay the penalty for our sin and by repenting, believing it, and then repenting or turning of our sin and confessing him as our Lord and Savior, here's what happened. Here's the passion. The greatest gift, the gift of gifts, we receive peace with God. We receive peace with God, a right relationship with God through the forgiveness of our sin. And then in that moment of salvation, eyes up here, eyes up here, at that moment of salvation, God looks at you and I as if we've never sinned. 
Jesus died for all of your sin and mine, past, present, and future ones that we don't even know we're going to commit yet. And he died out of his great love. And when we are saved, we are made new, filled with the Holy Spirit, made new. And God looks at us, and he looks at us through the perfect blood of his son, just as if we've never sinned. Because he looked at Jesus as if he had committed every sin of every person who will ever live in history. And poured his wrath out on them. There's no greater love than this. There's no greater, this is Christmas. His presence for eternity as his people, his children. And this is the declaration of Christmas, John 3, 16. You'll see it right here. Maybe you've heard it. For God so loved the world that he gave, in that great rescue mission, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish in hell for eternity, but have eternal life. Why? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it but in order that the world might be saved through him. There's Christmas. If I could sum it up, I couldn't say it any better than Pastor John Piper. You'll see it on the screen. The Son of God, here's Christmas, the Son of God expressing the love of God to save us from the wrath of God so we could enjoy the presence of God. There it is. There's Christmas. The Son of God expressing the love of God to humble himself in his mercy and compassion for you and I in coming to earth to save us from the wrath of God so that we could enjoy the presence of God forever and be removed for eternity from the presence of sin. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears. Through Christ alone, the gift of gifts. Salvation is given through Jesus alone. Here's our question facing us. You've heard the truth right here. Will you believe in him? And if you're here and you've never confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your first step is what we just walked through here. First step is to repent and confess your sin and say, Jesus, you alone are Lord. I believe it and I will follow you. My life is yours and receive at that moment the gift of gifts, a Christmas like no other. You don't have to clean yourself up to get there. He's like, I see you right there. I see you. Just like I saw Joseph and spoke to him, I see you, and I'm speaking this to you right now. Don't wait. The gift of gifts is waiting. And followers of Christ who've made that decision here, what does this mean for us now, the incarnation, that Jesus has come In the day today that God is with us, Emmanuel, God with us. Here's what it means, ready? Here's what it means. We so encourage, loved ones, Jesus is with you in your pain. In fact, he knows how that struggle is impacting you even better than you know. He created you. He loves you. And he's with you in that. He's with you in the unknown. What's going to happen to the economy next year? What's going to happen political climate? What's going to happen wars and rumors of war? Jesus, if you are saved, it means he is with you and he will hold you steadfast. And you do not need to fear. Here's what else it means. God with us. It means he's with you in your fear and anxiety and you can cast it on him and be free of it and have peace. It means he can identify with your struggles and temptations of sin. Hebrews 4, 15, 16, say that so clearly. He was tempted in every way you and I are and yet did not sin. At all times and in all things, as you turn to him, he is ready to empower you and I with his comfort. Anyone in need of comfort tonight? His peace, his strength when you feel weak and weary, his joy, his hope, his truth, his wisdom, and his presence for your good and his glory as you call on his name. As we as followers of Christ live on his mission as his witness. See, Matthew 28, the very last verse of the book of Matthew. Right here, Jesus says, you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Then you go over to Matthew 28 and you get to verse 20. Do you know what Matthew ends this book with? Where Jesus told his disciples, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Book ends it. God with us. I'm with you always. What a promise. What a savior. What a savior. And uh, will you believe and draw near to him, church? Will you cast it on him and stop trying to do things in your own strength? Now, what happened to Joseph? What about Joseph? We're left hanging here. 
Thank goodness for verse 24 and 25. Let's close it out. When Joseph woke from sleep, here it is, watch this. Look at the faith. He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. One word. I'm in. I'll take the shame. I'll take the gossip. I'll take the rejection by the community. He took his wife. But notice this again. Matthew emphasized verse 25. But he knew her not. No consummation. No consummation. Until when? Until she had given birth to a son. And watch this. And he called his name Jesus. You see how that's so beautiful? Joseph believed and responded by faith. Will you? By taking Mary as his wife. And notice this. He called his name Jesus. Do you know what that means? When Joseph called Jesus and he named him? It means he adopted him. The son of God was adopted. Joseph wasn't his biological father. He was adopted. He gave him full legal rights in that home by naming him and taking him as his son. And because Joseph, verse 20, was from the line of David, what did it do? It fulfilled the word of God that the Messiah would come from David's line. Maybe some of us here are adopted biologically. Did you know the Savior knows what it's like to be adopted? Maybe some of us here lost a parent from an early age or had some absent parents. Did you know Jesus grew up Joseph died when Jesus was just young. He grew up without a father most of his life. A single mother. Did you know that? Why did he do that? So he could identify with us. What a savior. See, it's so clear. It's so clear. Right here, next slide. Jesus is the Messiah who has come to us. And you must believe in him alone for salvation. This is Christmas right here. This is our hope. There's no one like him. There's no one but him. Emmanuel, God with us. Will you believe? Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, the more I go through this, the more staggering it is. You left perfection and perfect glory in heaven and came to earth out of love to save us from our sin, to save your people, those who would confess and say, yes, Jesus, I'm a sinner, but you're the only Savior, and I put my faith and trust in you alone for salvation. And if you're here, and that's the decision that you need to make right now, just go before him right now and say, Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I believe I want to receive you as the gift of gifts, eternal life, forgiveness of sin. I know something's not working. I know, I know the darkness. I see it all around me. Oh, Lord, would you save me? Light of the world, would you save me? I repent and I confess you as Lord. And Father, for those of us who have made that decision right now, I pray we would leave her so encouraged that Jesus came as fully God and fully man and is with us always to the end of the age. That we are never alone. We are never alone. We have a friend who sticks closer than a brother. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, Emmanuel, God with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Loved ones, will you stand and respond in worship with us now?